Good afternoon from Brussels. Very happy to welcome here today our Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager for Europe Fit for the Digital Age and Commissioner uh, Irginius Sinkevicius, responsible for environment, fisheries and oceans. Pleasure to be with you. It's well, good to be here together, actually. Absolutely. Welcome here to our Citizens Dialogue, and we have today also 100 citizens connected to us via Zoom. And um, I will turn now to my co-moderator from Germany, uh, Dominic, please. Vivian? Oh, I can see myself. Vivian, can you hear me? Once you can hear me, Go just ahead. give me... Hi. Oh. Hi, Dominic. We're all here ready for you. We're ready for you, Dominic. Hello, Brussels. Hello. <laughs> Go ahead, Dominic. Explain us. I know that you've been busy over the past three days with our uh, citizens, 100 citizens from uh, five member states. Tell us what have you been uh, up to. There, there you are. There you are. Can you hear me, Vivian? Yes, please. Perfect. Uh, so that means we, we can give it a go. So we can start. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. So uh, thank you. So welcome uh, to all of you to the grand finale of our transnational digital citizens dialogue on Europe's uh, democratic digital and green future. You the randomly selected citizens from Lithuania, Denmark, Germany, Ireland and Italy have worked hard over the past three days. All discussions were online with the simultaneous interpretation in various groups and a unique setting that has never happened before. Now you have a chance to present your questions and, I, and discuss your ideas. And looking at my moderator colleague Vivian Lunela from the European Commission, I think we've got two guests uh, that are eager to hear more about what the participants of our Citizens Dialogue are thinking. Absolutely. Do tell us what would be waiting for us in the next hour. Well, I think it's going to be lively. So we will start with the topic uh, of democracy uh, for roughly 10-15 uh, minutes. Then we will continue with the digital and green topic and welcome people who are watching our debate live all over Europe. And as they watch our discussion, they also have a chance to bring in questions via social media. One more remark, uh, due to technical reasons, the two commissioners will speak in English. They haven't lost their Danish or Lithuanian language skills. It's just easier for all of us. So, and I said, we're starting with the topic of uh, democratic Europe. And I want to give the floor to Pietrius Mitskiewicz uh, from Lithuania, who lives close to the city of Kaunas. I think uh, Commissioner Sienkiewicz knows that much better than, than we do. Uh, Pietrius, you were talking about communication uh, in your group. So what was it all about? What, what are you, I, the ideas you came up with? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to, uh, for, for this opportunity for the citizens to express ourselves. On behalf of um, the whole group, I want to say that I really hope that this is first but not the last project of this kind. So um, uh, our group talked about the gap as a problem, gap between the EU institutions and the citizens. And we discussed how uh, the gap could be bridged, how we could solve this problem. To, we, uh, some of us only learned today that in every country, in every region, we have the representatives of the European Commission. And this uh, is a good example that uh, this information channel is not working well. We don't get uh, proactive information. We don't um, get enough visibility of the EU, its institutions. As an example, I could uh, give, uh, for example, schools, uh, TV programs where we could uh, get this information. Another thing would be uh, if we could have a uh, elected representative by the citizens, I would underline. Um, so if there would be an elected representative for 
every country in the uh, commission, then maybe the citizens would uh, have more trust in this person and maybe he could uh, give uh, mm, he would be a sort of an ambassador this person and uh, mm, for example um, as a Example could be the uh, election in Belarus, the problems that uh, we have breached. Uh, such person could convey the citizens' opinion to the EU institutions and the Commission. Well, we've got to speed up a little bit because we started late. So this is why I'd love to hear from two more of our table groups. Uh, and the, the next one uh, in line would be Julia Licker. Uh, from Germany, living close to Hanover, and Julia, you were also talking a little bit about uh, communication, and you had an interesting idea about a participation app. So, what what is that all about? Hello from Germany. My group was uh, working on transparency, and we'd like the EU to become more transparent and we'd like ordinary citizens to take part in the EU and its decision making. This could be an online platform or an app. We need to be able to get information about what the EU is doing on a daily basis and what uh, decisions are being taken. So short, snappy information for citizens is what we need. Secondly, uh, this should be relatively interactive. There could be surveys, for instance, polls, to make sure that citizens learn together and are networked with one another in the EU. We could have a cross-border citizens' dialogue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adina. And then, because we're already going live in five minutes, uh, so, but I... Before we ask it to Commissioners, Cherry, uh, in Ireland, in a nutshell, can you tell us why is education so important in that context of democracy? What is at the core of your idea? Cherry, you've got to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, the, the core of our idea is that there is an existence of primary and secondary uh, school programs. Uh, but they are not well known. You know, uh, there, we believe that, our group believe that possibly this type of programme should become mandatory in, edu in our education systems. Uh, there are also that there are civic centres that few people know about. Uh, and if they do know about them, they feel that they are not very accessible. Uh, we feel we need to do more on this. And we also believe that these European civic centres could bring petitions of concern directly in Europe. Uh, one of our members, in fact, has submitted a note on how this could be done, and we would ask that this be taken on board. Okay, so we pass on uh, that note to Brussels, and we'll pass on all the questions to Vice President Festag first, and then uh, Commissioner Sinkiewicz. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and please forgive me if I don't answer in, in great detail, because the, the mixture of translation and, and questions was, uh, was a bit um, interesting, uh, so to speak. Um, on, the, on the last point, obviously it's very difficult to engage in something that you don't know about. Uh, so it is important that in, uh, in the school system, in our media, that you also meet European news. Uh, I think one of the mistakes made is that sometimes you have to know a lot before you engage. You have to know about the institutions. You have to know about decision-making procedures. But the thing is that we discuss politics at home without necessarily knowing in every detail how the national parliament work or how in every detail actually the municipality work. And yet we engage to say, oh, we need to change this when it comes to agriculture or cars or how things could be done. Uh, and I think it's very important sort of to break down these barriers that you don't have to know everything to, to engage in a discussion. 
and, and I think media can do a lot to help this, as well as the schools. And uh, of course, I'm glad that you had discovered our representations. I think they will be very happy to hear that too, uh, because they are indeed open. And if there are, if teachers do not take the, the initiative, well, it's also open for, uh, for class representatives to say, well, maybe we should do uh, a school trip uh, and visit uh, the representation for them to tell us more about uh, what is actually uh, ongoing so that we get a connection that we would otherwise not have had. And uh, when Corona is over, uh, of course, I would encourage uh, you also to come here uh, to meet in particular the parliament, uh, because then you can connect better to the people who are elected in every country and to know so many things by heart, because when you have seen how they work, it's more likely that you can connect with them when they're in their home country close to you uh, and they can see uh, how you work, how you learn, uh, how you engage. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, I, I think uh, Vice President covered them uh, very well and uh, there is not so much to add, probably saying that um, I think the infrastructure is there. Uh, Probably now it's a little bit uh, harder to, to, to access, uh, you know, having it face to face due to COVID restrictions. But um, I highly encourage, of course, uh, to use those digital tools which are available, which are constantly improving. And actually all the time you access uh, commissions website or, or, or parliaments or other institutions website, they will ask for, for actually for your opinion how it can be improved. Uh, but all I can say that uh, probably most important decision making. Decision making in the EU is very complex and I can give you an example probably from being a, a, a national politician just a year ago uh, and now being a part of, 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 of EU, of the Commission's team. And here, uh, of course, we have to take into account uh, all member states. Uh, there are differences, uh, there are similarities, uh, and that's why the decision making sometimes takes longer. But I can reassure you that it is exactly about uh, looking at every single detail, evaluating, uh, having ambitious plans, but yet achievable. Uh, and uh, a good example is probably climate target. Uh, when uh, the first time climate law was brought into, into college, uh, there was a huge pressure uh, to straight away name a number of uh, uh, what is going to be the decrease, what is the plan for 2030 to, to degrees greenhouse gas emissions comparing to 1990. Uh, and there were, of course, different numbers. Uh, but the Commission took uh, a step of uh, six months doing uh, enormously huge work with scientists, stakeholders, uh, uh, citizens, of course, uh, uh, evaluating all the single detail, especially uh, social impact, economic impact, uh, uh, and uh, of course then coming up with a target of at least 55%, which is, would be achievable, and again would allow us to do that transition, uh, leaving no one behind. Overall, I think uh, this process is extremely important and engaging, like today with uh, our citizens, is extremely important, not only for citizens to uh, understand what EU is doing, but also uh, for citizens to be part of those changes. Uh, because when we speak about digital and, and green transition, I think this is, this is something we are going to grow with, uh, grow with uh, for many, many years to come. And uh, I think nothing can be more uh, interesting uh, and encouraging rather than being part of it and being an active part. Uh, and that's why uh, I think there will be uh, numerous initiatives where I also ask citizens, groups uh, like this one, to be an active participant. Always express your opinion, being a part of, of, of a group or on your, on your own. And I can reassure you that uh, most of those opinions are being read, looked at, and of course, uh, then we look for the most balanced decision. Importantly, not leaving anyone behind and having everyone on board. Thank you. And we will now move to our uh, social media event. So, good afternoon from Brussels uh, to our Today's Citizens Dialogue, and I'm happy to welcome here not only one, but two members of the European Commission. Thank you. We will have 
We have Margaret Vestager, the executive vice president responsible for Europe for uh, Fit for the Digital Age. And we have um, Commissioner Virginia Sinkevich, uh, responsible for environment, oceans and fisheries. The topic for our today's discussion is uh, Europe's future that will be green and digital and how will we get there. You can send us your comments, please, and your questions via the Commission's Twitter and Facebook uh, channels. And thanks a lot to those who've already done so. And in addition to the online viewers, we also have a group of 100 uh, European citizens with us who've been uh, busy uh, for the past three days in a project put together by the European Commission and the Bertelsmann Foundation. Dominique Hielemann, my uh, co-moderator from Germany, would you want to explain to us what you've been busy with? Yes, gladly. So we have 100 citizens from Lithuania, Denmark, Germany, Ireland uh, and Italy, and they were randomly selected, so they represent the diversity of our society. And I can tell you they've been really busy and they've worked hard over the past uh, three days. They discussed uh, many ideas and big groups and smaller groups, always with people from several countries with simultaneous translation uh, in lots of video discussions. And they've come up with very concrete proposals and questions so let's give it a go and hear what they have to share. And I'd like to go to Ireland, to Shivun Hardyman. And she's got a question. She developed a question together with her group and a very concrete proposal about the power of uh, big tech giants. Shivun, would you like to share the question with us? Yes, of course. <clears throat> so our group really, what we thought about was the, the power really that these big tech groups hold. And, um, and it's really like to the extent that sometimes they seem more powerful than even governments. And as a group, we thought that it would be really good if we had a monitoring or an oversight committee. And we felt if this was formed, that it should sort of sit on a rotating basis of maybe a change in every 12 months. That would kind of oversee the, the social media giants and the tech giants. And it should, we felt that this group then should be made up of academics, people from small and medium enterprises, tech experts, consumers, citizens, and members of the pub, you know, and of the public. And we feel really that a group from all over Europe would be really good to have at this, because I'd said if we had a group from all over Europe, it would represent us all. And that was what we were thinking, just how we could do the, how we could monitor social media and tech giants. Thank you. Uh for, for that, Shivun, so monitor, uh, but not just by experts or by the Commission, but also uh, with the inclusion of citizens. Let's go to Italy and Emanuele Romani. Uh, and you were, had a couple of ideas about promoting digital competences. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and what your group worked on that, just about the digital competences ideas? Le competenze digitali proprio perché in questa Okay, during the course of this pandemic we've been able to see how digital is and will be the future, but there are some problems, there are gaps in knowledge among young people, but also in uh, older generations as well. I mean, this is something we can see on a daily basis, virtually, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, issues surrounding disinformation and fake news. And this is often accompanied by something uh, which is worth looking at from an infrastructure point of view. If you look at many regions, for example, in Italy or in the rest of Europe, many regions are, are fragile. And this is why we feel uh, in our group that it's very important to stress standardization of infrastructure across Europe, uh, uh, European technologies. Uh, personally, uh, I feel, and other members of the group felt as well, that it's important for the Commission to link European funds for uh, education, for example, to progress uh, in these areas. So funds should be linked to progress in these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very concrete proposal, uh, a mix of questions, uh, oversight, digital competences, and of course the future. Uh, Vice President Vestier, would you 
join our discussion. Yes, uh, I'd love to do that because those are two questions that uh, that I've also been asking myself and discussing with my teams and, and my colleagues uh, in the Commission. Uh, and, and the first suggestion to have such an, an oversight board, uh, the timing of that is really good because right now we are trying to figure out how to make sure that new obligations on big tech companies, how to make sure that they actually do what they are supposed to do. Uh, because legislation is only as good as it's enforced. If it's only on paper, then pff, doesn't really matter. So it's, it's very important for us now to get the ideas as to who should look into whether or not they actually live up to what they were supposed to do. Uh, like, for instance, being uh, more open about uh, why they recommend uh, things to us, um, why it is that we see what we see, why a, uh, an ad is targeted exactly to you uh, and maybe not to someone else, um, how to take that responsibility because you really have a big influence on how our public debate works, how business works, how our democracy works. Uh, I don't know if it should be such a, 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 um, a citizen's oversight board, uh, but at least it's such a good idea that Facebook have established uh, such an oversight board, only they pay for it themselves. Uh, but here, maybe I think your, your good idea is that it's independent and it's people who are, you know, day-to-day -day users uh, to see what is actually ongoing. So I, will, I have noted uh, that idea. And the second question on... Uh, on digital skills, uh, you know, right now, even in this uh, enormous crisis that we're in of health and, and economics, there are hundreds of thousands of empty positions for professionals uh, who really knows uh, computers and, and digital. Uh, so there's a lot of, of need of skills. And also for every one of us to be able to use digital government services, uh, to be able to organize ourselves in a digital way. Also in basic skills, we need to do more. Uh, and this is why we are promoting uh, that in the recovery fund, that money can be used to establish exactly educational programs, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, uh, and to make sure that it's for all generations. Uh, because even if you're uh, sort of an older generation, well, you will still need to be able to, to use uh, digital tools. Uh, and one of the concrete things that we will do is to develop such a, a, an, a digital certificate, like you know you have sort of the language skill certificates, so that you can show, uh, for instance, employers uh, what is your level of, uh, of digital skills and that everyone in Europe would recognize this as something that they would actually uh, use to see, well, oh, this person who is uh, maybe traveling and want to work in another country has this level of digital skills, and I know exactly what they are talking about. So both for the funds to push them uh, and, of course, to make sure that people can document what it is that they have been learning. Many thanks, uh, Vice President. So I'd like to bring in uh, the group of Anja Fritze. Anja, your group uh, has a question on... Uh, hate speech and fake news uh, that is related to that field of our discussion. Would you like to post your question? Yes, there are various different uh, regulations. I think there's even a law against uh, incitement. I don't think it really goes far enough, actually. Because we often find that the rules surrounding fake news aren't properly checked. And we find that there's lots of fake news out there which isn't uh, taken down. So we see that this is very dangerous, actually. These uh, false, this false news... It can actually lead to people being uh, mistreated in some ways. It can lead to uh, uh, wrong statistics. And it can lead to further false information on the Internet. So we feel that serious news sources need to be promoted in some way. People need to be alerted to the fact that uh, something is a serious news source. 
Great. So thanks a lot for the questions that are coming in already. And I see the first one is from Michaela, who's posted on Facebook. How are digital and green going to match in this transition? Commissioner, you'd want to go first. Thank you. Probably uh, that's a good question, which uh, should be expected in, in, in this dialogue. And, and thank you very much for, for, for Michaela for, for, for giving us this opportunity. First of all, I think, you know, if you look at the uh, green transition, it's going to, to, to affect uh, most of the areas. And uh, one of the key probably to move uh, along with the, with the green transition is energy. I can't imagine energy sector really going uh, renewable uh, without uh, digital helping us to do so. Uh, we're talking about the smart grids, we're talking about smart solutions, we're speaking about, uh, you know, solar panels, uh, interconnectors, and etc. So that's uh, one very simple example which is close to, my, uh, to, to, to all of us. But uh, transport sector, it's definitely going to, to be affected heavily. Without digital solutions, I hardly e imagine that uh, this transition is going to happen. And that transition, I'm not speaking only about, you know, revolutionary things, uh, about very simple things, uh, like an app which can uh, show you every morning, uh, 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 giving you a good answer, uh, not to uh, take your car, but uh, what sort of public transport mm -hmm. or um, uh, shared economy uh, solution to use to, to, to go to work or, or meet your friends when, of course, the COVID uh, measures is lifted. Um, uh, so I think there is multiple uh, examples where uh, green is not possible uh, without uh, digital. And I'm truly happy that today uh, we're going to, to, to cover it and discuss it and show that this is the twin transition uh, and this is the only uh, transition trajectory which we will be going up until 2050 yeah. and unavoidably getting everyone on board, uh, accustomed with it, uh, knowing more, of, of course, about it is going to be uh, our task. Well, ac actually, I don't think that we can have the green transition without digital tools uh, because it's such a massive effort uh, that we'll have to do. Uh, Virginia uh, just mentioned obvious examples. Uh, if you have wind, solar, hydro, energy, how to integrate that without a digital help, not going to happen. Uh, but also, uh, for instance, just the cars that we have right now, before we go electric, uh, a lot of digital is helping us to use those cars more efficiently. Uh, just a very simple thing as the car telling you, you have to shift your gear in order not to use so much fuel. It's an itsy bitsy tiny thing, but all these itsy bitsy tiny things, they all help. Uh, if we are going to fight uh, food waste, uh, well, then we uh, very often would need a digital tool uh, actually to organize sort of redistribution of, uh, of food that would otherwise be wasted. A lot of food is, is wasted before it even gets to the shop, just between the field and the shop. And here also digital can help us uh, to tax things uh, for containers to be out there with with uh, climate uh, equipment so that things doesn't rot uh, on the way to, to the marketplace. So actually, I think when you go through everything, you'd find that there is a digital side. Uh, when you have sensors in water pipes that allows you to see, well, how is water being used and how can we preserve valuable, clean drinking water? Uh, and this is, uh, this is indeed why we talk about it as twins, uh, because the, the two come together uh, and they cannot live uh, without one another. Because there's also a thing about all digital, and that is that we need to get their energy consumption down. Uh, before COVID, uh, when we were all flying a lot, well, the, the carbon footprint of data storage and cloud and what have you, I'm being told that that was the same as the footprint of flying. So we really need to work on, on digital, also using less energy, uh, in order to get uh, the best use of it. But it's, it's a great helper to, to achieve our green goals. Great, thank you. Next we have Franco on LinkedIn, who's asked that Europe is now at the forefront of the um, European Green Deal in the world, but what, can, what would be the best strategy to you to see other nations follow its path? Would you like me to? Okay, thank you very much, Franco, for your question. I think... Uh, of course, uh, on one hand, uh, Europe 
cannot uh, be responsible or, let's say, can't take off all 7 billion people on the planet. But what Europe can and what Europe actually already does is leading by example. Uh, uh, very clearly, this commission from uh, early days in the office in December stepped up the ambition and, and said that uh, Europe is going to be climate neutral by 2050. That, of course, followed with uh, uh, action plans, strategies, and etc. But most importantly, that followed with other leaders uh, actually um, following and, 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 and supporting us, and most importantly, joining. And we have only in 2019, it was New Zealand and Australia who announced that they're going to be climate neutral by 2050, even maybe one of those countries, I might be wrong, and said 2045. Um, then this uh, week was actually significant because we had at the beginning of week Japan announcing to, to, to be climate neutral by 2050 and a couple days ago South Korea said that by 2050 they're going to decarbonize their economy. A month ago China announced that they're going to do it by 2060. So I remember very well when the Green Deal was accepted and uh, we were quite a lot told that look at uh, uh, that little percentage EU is responsible for. But I, I think this is the, the spirit of the EU taking re responsibility for a much, uh, much wider than uh, only its borders uh, uh, and, and for a much wider challenges. And I'm happy that uh, we were not afraid mm -hmm. to take on the biggest challenge for our generation and generations to come. And uh, leading by example proves that we are being uh, joined and we're not uh, uh, sitting on its own by, by this uh, table solving this uh, biggest challenge, as we said, biggest challenge that our society is facing and going to be facing for, for a long time. And, and maybe um, also adding maybe something's a bit of a stick. Uh, because I completely agree with Virginia. It's so encouraging that, that other countries say we want to be climate neutral also by 2050. But the thing is, it takes action to get there. It doesn't happen like this, poof, and there you go. Now, a lot of things will have to happen. And, and also, a lot of, of European industry will have to, to change. Uh, will have to use uh, green hydrogen to produce steel and cement and, and all of that. And if, if countries who want to import things to Europe, if they don't do the same, well, they may be able to produce much cheaper in the short run because they don't pay for the damage they do to our climate. Uh, and here we are working on something that we call the border adjustment mechanism. So to make sure that uh, people outside of Europe have an incentive to do the same, because otherwise we'd say, well, if you want to import into Europe, then, of course, we have to regulate for the fact that you're not doing what you said you wanted to do when it comes to climate. And, and I think it is quite important that we are also concrete and specific so that people can see that it comes with a consequence, actually, to say this is where, this is where we want to go. Um, and then I think also it will serve as well, uh, because right now uh, businesses in Europe, uh, they develop a lot of technology and a lot of ways of using technology in order uh, actually to limit their footprint. And that, of course, comes with great benefits because eventually everyone will have to do the same. Thank you. Next, we have the uh, question from Youth IGF via Twitter about um, cybersecurity. That what would be the kind of actions to be implemented to promote cybersecurity uh, skills for young and also how to reduce the cybersecurity gap in Europe? Should I give it a go? It's, uh, it's a very tricky question uh, because when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, member states have most of the competence. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that on an everyday basis, we really need to help each other. <clears throat> uh, and actually, right now, we see that uh, cyber attacks, they're going up. Uh, it wasn't just in spring uh, when hospitals were actually attacked. Uh, we see that uh, awful things are happening when people have their data stolen. Uh, so it's indeed a thing. Uh, and this is why we work with member states for our 5G network to be secure. 
uh, because without that network being secure, it's very difficult to use for all the important things, for government services, for industry purposes, for all kinds of data transmission. Uh, but I really like the point to say that it's important that it's also part of how we learn how to deal with uh, computers, how we, how we learn to deal with our, with our uh, different gadgets. Uh, because very often cybersecurity comes to a human error. That it's, it's someone, uh, oh, you get a mail, oh, it looks real, I click on a link, and oof, there you are, uh, you have an issue. So I think it's, it's, it's a very good point to say, well, we need this also uh, in schools, we need for parents to talk with their children about how to behave online, uh, not to risk uh, things on your own, and not to make sure that, that you breach and, and create access uh, for others. That being said, I think it's very important that we have uh, strong services in every member state and that they cooperate uh, because when you have a, a large-scale cyber attack, it's very important that you have the capacity to push back uh, in real time and that takes a lot of very clever people and here we ought to cooperate even though uh, we cannot tell member states to do so because we don't have the competence. And now we'll go uh, straight again to our Zoom link. We'll have a question for us. Thank you, uh, Vivian. Uh, so I'd like to bring in uh, our participants who have worked hard, our citizens over the past uh, three days on proposals uh, for uh, a dream in Europe. Marie Larsen from Denmark. So you've got an idea on food waste that was already mentioned by the vice president and on transparency and packaging. What is it about? Yes, we've been talking about lots of things. For instance, we decided that the rules in Denmark, where you have two labels for the date, one says uh, for how long the, um, the product can last, and the other says for how long it is actually edible, there are these various uh, labels, and in fact, you can use some foodstuffs much longer than the end date. We would like to have more education to work out uh, for how long one can keep a foodstuff and how you can use your, your food waste, as it were, how you don't just throw it out, but you actually eat it. And another question on food uh, from Alessandra Nespolino in Italy. Alessandra from Naples, what is your idea about what would you like to know from the commissioners? Okay, so good afternoon. It's a great honor to be able to ask these questions and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be able to speak directly to European commissioners our question uh, came forward with a question. How realistic do you think it will be? And in what time frame do you think organic food will be uh, accessible to everybody? When would uh, organic foods be accessible to everybody? I'm talking in particular about uh, people who are in an economically precarious situation and uh, when's there going to be more organic uh, school meals uh, that won't lead to additional costs for families? Thank you. Back to Brussels. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, both, uh, for your uh, very good questions and, and, and very important questions. Probably that's uh, really an issue when we speak uh, about the EU and, uh, first of all, how we treat food uh, when we generate uh, annually around uh, 88,000 uh, uh, tons of, 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 of food waste, which is uh, equivalent to 143 uh, billion euros. And, um, uh, of course, this is a uh, huge challenge to, to, to face. And first of all, of course, it, it starts with the education, how we treat food. Uh, we uh, have in our farm-to-fork strategy um, 
set a, a very clear goal to have uh, a legally binding target on food uh, waste decrease, uh, which is going to start from 2023, but definitely that's go not going to be enough. And uh, as I said, uh, important to address issues of packaging, of how put, uh, food is pack packed, and, and of course over packaging is, is one thing, but what size of portions, plate uh, size can play a role, and etc. Uh, now moving to uh, a second question of accessibility of organic food. Organic farming is definitely among the priorities uh, for us. And again, under the Farm to Fork strategy, by 2030, our goal is to have a quarter of all farming in the EU, 25%, uh, farmed organically. That, of course, uh, with increase of organic uh, farming, uh, of its accessibility, would mean uh, definitely a also uh, bigger accessibility to consumers. Uh, what's most important, we want to make it more open. Uh, we want to make it easier uh, for small farmers, for example, to convert into organic farming with uh, our help, of course, uh, but most importantly, not sacrificing those high quality standards which we have in the EU. And the last bit, of course, under the new regulation on organic farming, we will take into account also an imported organic food. EU is open, but uh, our high standards also has to be uh, respected. Maybe just one thing, because I think it's a great idea um, this, that you have a labeling that says best before, because then you realize that it's not, it's not going bad just the day after. Uh, and I think in, in, in making all of these strategies, very important things that Virginia is talking about, I think there's also something we can do as a, as a, as a citizen when we have the labeling, because then we'll use our senses also to relate better to the food, to say, well, okay, it may be best before yesterday, but it still smells lovely, and, and of course I would eat it instead of throwing it out. And I think that is also very important that we sort of reconnect with real food uh, and not being able to, to cook our food ourselves, because then we get a different relationship, and I, I don't think that we would that we'd throw out uh, so much food as we do today. Thanks. And following up on the importance of food, we get a lot of questions or more statements on our social media channels about Stop the Cat, the Common Agriculture Policy. We'd want to give an answer on where we stand on that. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'm, I'm truly um, I truly see the engagement of uh, especially young people in, in, in a cap reform. Uh, which is absolutely needed. And Commission stands firm uh, that CAP has to uh, take on board uh, the Green Deal, uh, environmental policies such as uh, biodiversity and farm to fork strategy and its goals, and uh, of course uh, digital transition. Uh, because again, it's going to give our farmers uh, the tools uh, to farm even in a more sustainable way. Now, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Parliament voted on, on, on a cap. Uh, it's different from the Commission's proposal, uh, but I see uh, a lot of differences uh, between the Parliament, Council position, and of course, Commission, which stays firm with its position, and of course, uh, those strategies and our main Green Deal objective. So I think the trilogues will be very intense, but I see lots of space in possib and possibilities in actually greening the cap. I'm sure that uh, Commission uh, position will stay firm, and especially with your support, uh, it's going to have an additional boost and, and arguments to support its position, but most importantly to realize that biodiversity strategy, farm to fork strategy, uh, Green Deal, it's not against anyone. Uh, it's actually for, and first of all, it's for our farmers. If we want them to farm, uh, if we want that uh, those uh, guardians of our land would be able uh, to do their activities in a much more sustainable uh, manner, but most importantly, generations after them could do the same, uh, we need to protect, of course, uh, our soil. We need to treat it uh, sustainably. We need to protect uh, and uh, stop uh, the decline of pollinators because uh, the truth is that environment is supporting system which cannot be replaced. And if we will go through the tipping points which uh, cannot be undone, that's going to be too late. 
and the first victims on the line is going to be our farmers. So I think here it's an important angle to take into discussion, and I believe that we will be able to find uh, best possible solution to make CAP part of the Green Deal, but most importantly CAP working for our planet, for our citizens, for future generations, and of course our farmers. And next we'll have uh, Ronnie from Ireland, who's asked on Twitter, can Europe not uh, drastically accelerate parts of the digital transition? But if we execute it with, with the uh, ordinary speed, um, we will see very little results before 2024, when it will be too late. But if we really put the speed on now, we can, it can significantly help in the current pandemic as well as being invaluable to our recovery. I, I share this sense of impatience. Could we, could we just move on? Um, the good thing is that now uh, our leaders, uh, heads of state and government, uh, they have agreed with the Commission uh, that 20 percent of, uh, of the recovery fund, um, I think that's the same as uh, 134 billion euros, quite a lot of money that that should be used uh, now within a short time span exactly to accelerate. Uh, that can be in, in skills, it can be in connectivity, uh, it can be in helping businesses to, to digitalize, but also to invest in, in something that we can have in common, uh, like uh, high-performance uh, computers that we can use uh, exactly when it comes to greening uh, to have sort of a, a digital twin of our planet so that we can see well, how will climate ch change uh, uh, work, so how can we best uh, counter it. Um, it can also be investment in, in quantum computing uh, and, of course, in, in much more use of artificial intelligence. So now we see that we have more funds available, so we work with member states in order actually to, to get things done, uh, while at the same time, uh, of course, being careful that some of the things that we really believe in, like, for instance, that you should have a fair chance if you have the talent to get a job, you should not be discriminated against, that if artificial intelligence is used in that process of hiring people, it shouldn't discriminate uh, women or people with another background. Uh, it should be fair and square based on the merits. So while we promote it, we also try to make sure that, that no harm is done uh, where it is something fundamental like the right not to be discriminated against if that is at stake. Now we'll try to turn back to our citizens via Zoom. Yes, we go straight to Milan in Italy and ask uh, Bianca, uh, who has worked on uh, Green Europe uh, with her group. So what is your idea, your proposal and your question to the commissioners? Bianca. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for making me uh, the spokesman for my group. So we discussed a number of different issues in the last couple of days. We think it's very important that people uh, throughout Europe are aware of environmental issues. So we weren't just talking about uh, looking at this from the point of view of the curriculum in schools, but we're looking at other initiatives which could recreate awareness for respect for the environment uh, among the adult population as well. And experts uh, in our group made the point that there are penalties and fines for those people who don't uh, respect the environment, but actually the time frame of all of this can be quite long. So what we are asking for is how the European Union could raise awareness among everybody of the penalties which are there for member states and for citizens as well, and as well as uh, third countries. And if it's possible in some way, uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to apply these sanctions and penalties. Thank you. Back to Brussels. I'll take that one. No, you go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for your question. First of all, I'm not a fan of, of, uh, of, of fines and sanctions. I think first we have to deal with uh, and try to do utmost with education. 
uh, education and secondly, of course, realization to about what is actually right to do, what is a, a long-term solution which will bring benefits to all, uh, to uh, society and thinking about society as a whole. And I think here uh, the most important thing is uh, probably uh, to realize that we can have best written legislation, uh, perfectly written legislation, uh, but it's going to be successful as long as it's implemented. And implementation starts not uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from, from the top, but it actually starts from the local level, uh, from uh, you as a EU citizen, uh, from uh, your municipality, your town, your neighborhood, uh, and, 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 and then goes to, to, to countries and union level. And that's probably most important, that citizens would be aware of what is happening, what are the developments. Citizens would be part of it, would feel part of it, and of course support it. Uh, then I think we don't need a sanctions and fines. But of course, uh, Commission is the guardians of the treaty. Uh, and when we see the breach of the treaty or let's say uh, breach of certain EU legislation, we of course step up and engage uh, with member states, first of all in the dialogue and uh, assistance, uh, technical assistance uh, or, 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 or any other possible assistance to member states to fully implement the EU legislation. If that's not the case, then of course we, we, we go with the, with, the further, uh, with the further steps. But I'm always counting on member states uh, to uh, respect the EU legislation. And of course we're always happy to assist them and help them to fully implement the EU law. Thank you. Well, time is running short. And I'd like to just thank you so much for having been here today. Thank you very much, Vice President. Thank you, Commissioner. And thanks a lot to our viewers both from online as well as the citizens who have been engaged over the past three days from uh, Lithuania, Denmark, Italy, Germany and Ireland. Thanks so much for switching in and uh, do uh, stay tuned to our next debates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot.